Dorothy, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, thank you for this uh, brilliant paper you've written, uh, putting out a very interesting argument on the value of arts, culture, and humanities in a prosperous society um, as part of your global fellowship with the Logatum Institute. I wanted to begin the conversation by first asking you, um, what, how do you define a prosperous society? Well, I think there's, um, the mistake is to cling too rigidly or exclusively to, uh, let's say, uh, financial success, um, uh, the quality of life. There's so much evidence um, about the need of people to you know, live in harmony together, to have a stimulating environment. I mean, we live it right here at the Phillips Collection in a downtown urban neighborhood um, where people live and work. They covet uh, the access through public transportation, um, the, the sense of the, the wholeness of, of their experience. And I think that's one of the elements of my discussion is that um, to sort of break out of this sense of polarization that we're talking about um, economic issues versus um, cultural, artistic, quality of life issues. I think that really is um, maybe um, Edward Wilson's term, consilience, to actually forge, recreate the ties between the disciplines um, and to actually infuse that sense of consilience, the word he uses, um, back into our, our, our civic discourse. And that, again, is one of, as you well know, because you've read the essay, uh, I think one of the key arguments for the importance of that aspect of life, that it helps to allow um, for um, humane discourse, for, for good listening, or breaking down barriers. So I guess to come finally around to answering your question, it's the wholeness of the human experience. It's, it's um, to really focus on that sense of, a, of the complexity of the human being and the variety and richness of the needs that should be fulfilled. So it's basically about integration and seeing how things interconnect and link rather than kind of siloing or, or just dividing things. It's about the whole picture. Very much so. And um, um, I was always glancing at um, words from our founder, Duncan Phillips, who was a prolific writer and a keen intellect, besides being a great art collector. He was very, very involved with issues of internationalism, of world peace. And he clung to this notion of to see as artists see. There's something very um, intriguing and compelling about that idea. Um, and I think that's why the arts um, speak to us, because it, uh, there's this notion of opening the door to um, aspects of thought, of feeling, of empathy, of understanding, that I think all of us are incapable of attaining without that broader um, sense of uh, discovery and challenge by, by the arts. Um, there's so many um, instances lately, um, just I think we're all bombarded with this sense of fragmentation, of a lack of uh, connection, of strife, of a, a intransigent um, discord. And I think that, um, I hope that in some way I make arguments about culture and humanistic discourse that could be taken seriously as um, a beneficial tonic to that, to that malady. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on why it's important to put forward this argument at this time. I mean, you know, we just had the Humanities Commission report came out last year making the case, you know, for the humanities and the liberal arts, and there's, you know, debates going on about, you know, what our education policy should be, you know, here in the U.S. as well as in the U.K. and in other places. So, so why is it important to, why, why is this argument important, important right now? Well, um, I think it's pushed 
forwards uh, in a sense of urgency for lots of really, um, I think we're buffeted by um, a sense of crisis, financial crisis. I mean, you see it playing out in Detroit right now. Uh, and I mean, such a polarization, this idea of um, um, selling works of art that are in the public trust at the museum in order to pay for the pension plans of the city workers, um, which is, I find, an incredibly simplistic, um, foolhardy, um, reductive notion of, um, you know, let, we need cash. You know, where's, where's my cash cow? Uh, the notion that, um, I mean, I remember years ago when I lived in Dallas, Boeing was looking to relocate their headquarters. And there were two cities in the running in the end. It was Dallas and it was Chicago. And in the end, why did Boeing choose Chicago? Though I think the cli cultural climate might be quite different. Uh, it's, it's the, Dallas has become so sophist more sophisticated culturally in the last 20 years. But they, cho they said they chose Chicago because of the quality of life, the museums, the uh, urbanistic opportunities that their workers demand. So if, if you're thinking long term, the health of Detroit, of attracting people to live, resettle those desolate, decimated urban um, 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 terrains, uh, you don't give away one of your key assets. Instead, you forefront that as an enticement, as a value added in your efforts to long-term build the health of that city. Um, so that's one example. Those are a couple of examples. So it's, uh, it's basically short-sightedness and, and, and not looking at uh, the value of things in, in, in the long-term. Well, there's, there's such a lot of economic pressure I mean, we, you feel that this, um, but those are um, short-term, fill the gap kind of solutions. Um, I think instead to focus on the um, philosophical, the moral, ethical values of art, but also the instrumental values. There's so many studies. There's a new study out just within the past few weeks University of Arkansas and the new wonderful Crystal Bridges Museum uh, that Alice Walton has, has built. Um, they have a longitudinal, um, uh, very scientific with control group study about the impact of one school visit during the year of kids in, in the region on their reading abilities, their learning capacities. I mean, there are so many studies like that. So I think that um, to value the arts and education, uh, the public good, um, to see its impact in learning, its impact on economic growth. Um, I, mean, I find it also fascinating how cities change and grow and ameliorate what had previously been a sort of desolate neighborhoods around the arts. Um, there's a wonderful example of that here in Washington. Um, uh, 14th Street, uh, 14th and P. Um, it's fairly recent there t uh, that the ch incredible change happens. Now, if you don't go there every two weeks, you'll miss the new restaurants and new um, apartment buildings and condos. Um, there were two anchors that the catalyst for that incredibly vibrant urban revitalization. It was Whole Foods and it was studio theater. And I mean, so I'm sort of circling back with yet another example to your original question, how do I define a prosperous society? And then, and then certainly there's a role for the artists and the arts to play in, in you know, societies that aren't free and, and adding to uh, you know, under, you know, prosperity in different ways or sort of the, the, you know, the, the grassroots movements in, in society as well. Well, some, some of the for me, the most poignant or telling um, um, anecdotes that I tried to harvest into uh, my discussion involved things like, there's wonderful Pierre Doulen, who is a ballroom dance expert, um, who um, actually I included here in a discussion about cultural diplomacy 
Um, he has this wonderful film that's come out about um, uh, dancing in Jaffa and basically bringing together the Palestinian kid with the Israeli kid, not only bringing them in the same room, but through ballroom dancing, allowing them to touch, and how um, it, the, the parents were challenged by this. The kids were terrified of this because they'd been taught to see those other kids as enemies in a war zone. And the success of his effort was just so, so incredible. And the, the phrase that I remember is that one little boy, and, and it wasn't easy, um, in the little clip of the film that I saw at a certain point, he's throwing up his hands and marching out of, of the whole thing, you know, saying, I'm done with all of you. I'm not, I'm not putting up with this BS. And um, the kids finally overcame so many of these um, issues of prejudice and hatred. And this wonderful phrase of one little boy said, but, but what if I look in her eyes and I fall in love with her? I mean, isn't that a, a fantastically, I mean, it's schmaltzy, I'll admit <laughs> it, but he, it's real. He accomplished that. Um, you know, it seems to me to be closer to success than all of the elaborate political peace processes that have failed. That was actually, that was leading into my next question, actually, what, you know, the, the role of the arts beyond, uh, beyond just, you know, aesthetics and, and, you know, I mean, it's just, how can the arts play, you know, a, a valuable integral role in, in addressing current challenges that, you know, global challenges that, 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 that the United States faces and, and all other countries? You know, I have a, I have a um, fresh, fresh out of the headlines story for you. We were asked, we at the Phillips, um, we were asked by the State Department to send one of our educators um, to Pakistan. She spent almost a month um, in Islamabad and Lahore, teaching over 300, I forget, three to 400 um, emerging artists, little kids, orphans, students, um, about the Jacob Lawrence migration series here. So it's one of the key iconic um, uh, works of art within our collection. We have half of it, MoMA in New York has the other half. It's a 60 work, 60-piece series about the um, migration of the African American from rural South to urban North in the, uh, in the 20th century. We use it as a cornerstone for our arts integration educational practice in the schools in DC, but we've, we've sent it out to 12 different communities all across the states, whether it's San Antonio, um, in New York City, in Santa Fe, and we've developed a methodology, not to turn every kid in the school into an artist, that's really beside the point, but to mentor the teacher to use with confidence arts um, to teach the core subject better, be it history, social studies, writing, and we've done this now oh, you know, for, for many years, I would say almost two decades, so the State Department noticed the impact of this, invited our educator to apply that, those techniques and that methodology um, in, in Pakistan. And I have to say, I found that we have a very little staff, so this is like take, you know, cloning the people I've already cloned it to do all the great work that they accomplish, but it was, she desperately wanted to go, and I found that the whole experience, we ended up, about 15 of those students were brought here. We hung some of their art in the galleries vis-a-vis -vis the Jacob Lawrence. Think about reinforcing confidence, um, mutual understanding. Um, I mean, we know more about Pakistan. Those, those young people had never, most of them had not traveled outside of Pakistan. They'd certainly never been in the States. And they spent time with us, and in Washington, they had another element of their trip in New York City. Um, I think that these are not simply heartwarming anecdotes. I think that it's really fundamental to the kind of um, idea about building empathy and uh, basic 
ability to participate effectively in a democracy. That Martha Nussbaum, for instance, the Chicago-based um, philosopher, um, discusses so eloquent, eloquently that I mean, she refers to her own experience with the Chicago um, Children's Choir and how it was the one forum where you could get people of dramatically different background, education, um, race, um, just every, all the differences, in a sense, eradicated because they could share the common platform of trying to learn to sing, to participate and cooperate to effectively join in singing in a choir. So I think that that kind of, again, it's the, um, the, the moral, ethical role of the arts that I think I shouldn't say this, I love painting. I've spent my life as an art historian and a curator, so I'm not producing an anti-aesthetic uh, argument here, but I think that um, in this, at this certain juncture in time, it seems so compelling to me to um, explore, grant to the arts and humanities the fullness of their, of their power, which which really is, um, you know, to see as artists see, to offer people that authentic experience. So it's about education, participation, creating community, and creating that social capital that, that really makes a society flourish. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, I guess we're having this, dis this discussion as well you know, at a time of crisis, when you think about the Detroit story, that incredibly bitter, sort of heart-wrenching tension um, in a city that has really failed. Um, there's, it really seems as though um, the need to reinvent ourselves, to find every means possible to learn better, to, um, you know, unfurl our creative potential um, so that we can innovate, invent our future, solve the problems. There, there's lots of um, qualitative and quantitative evidence to prove the impact that the arts can have in accomplishing that. But, um, you know, there's just, there's this sense, I remember years ago that there was a sort of a revolution within the museums that you really had to retreat from that kind of stale, neutral, almost forbidding mission that we're here to preserve and protect. And instead, it shifted around to the audience to serve, to engage, to enhance participation and learning and encourage people to become stakeholders in a bigger enterprise. That it has, that fundamental shift in mission has transformed the entire profession of art museums, and every museum, I should say, during my career, that is for sure. But now there are added challenges, technology. Um, the insistence on the part of many people, especially of a certain generation, that they, they have a role in curating, in um, fashioning their experience. They demand that experience on every platform, including right up front and personal with a, with a painting. But they also want to, you know, there's you curate. They want to be able to manipulate and redo the exhibit that, that your curator um, did. They want, they want to see this uh, on a YouTube video today. Um, the idea of um, supplementing the authenticity authentic personal encounter with a work of art, and that could be a, a book or a poem or a play or a concert um, or, a, or dance, um, to supplement that with all of the capacities um, that technology um, uh, offer to us today. And what comes along with that is also think about all of the financial challenges presented to, you know, a, um, a small, you know, um, 
nimble but you know challenged institution or a large one. It's the the I think every university feels feels this, and I'll be curious to hear from the president of GW, my good friend Stephen Knapp, this evening. It's um, you know are you, service to your audience, to your customers, attention to them. You know, is it a big um, open source online course, or is it a seminar taught in this gallery at the Phillips? It's both. It's, mm. it's everything. It's everything, and there's so many various ways of collaboration yeah. these days. So. That's a key. Yeah. That collaboration, I have to say, is one of the most sort of beautiful and enhancing um, aspects of our work. And in Washington, we really have such a um, unusual and rich circumstance for a relatively small private, by private I mean not federal, um, um, not-for-profit arts institution because we have embassies, we have think tanks, universities, a kind of cultural and intellectual diversity to really um, make this museum that um, agora, that um, open place, that um, a safe place for that civil discourse, open discourse. Maybe conversations can transpire here that could never transpire on the Hill um, in the halls of Congress. And that's an exciting opportunity. Well, we hope we look forward to having one of those conversations tonight uh, at well. our panel discussion. And uh, thank you again for this this really fascinating paper, and uh, and for for being part of our fellows program. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you.